I'm Rob Trusinski with Symposium Magazine. My guest today is Paul Matsko, uh, editor for technology and innovation policy at the Cato Institute and author of The Radio Right. Thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure to be with you, Rob. So I, I, I asked you to be on today because you wrote a really interesting Twitter thread on the Fairness Doctrine, which is based on your work for your book, The Radio Right, looking at the history of how the Fairness Doctrine was, was implemented, because there's a certain nostalgia for it that people are having today. And this is, this is part of a wider question of you know, people grappling with what does free speech mean uh, in the age of the internet and how do you apply it to social media and all of that. So I want to. I just want to start by asking you quickly. What what is it that people are saying about the fairness doctrine, and how are they trying to revive it? And then we can go into the the actual history of it. It, it would be nice, <clears throat> as a historian. You, there's never we, we never have any conversations that we've not had in the past, <laughs> right? Like so it, it's not that the past repeats; it rhymes. That there's the old you know the old aphorism, and there's some truth there. But it's it's that the conversations pop up again and again and again every time you have a new mass media forum. Uh, form, you know, in this case, social media, um, we have similar debates, uh, same debates as we had over the rise of cable news in the 70s and 80s, over the rise of television broadcasting in the 40s and 50s, radio in the 20s and 30s. It's the same conversation over and over again, even if the outcomes are different potentially each time. So it's not set in stone what happens, but I can, I, I can swear to you that every time a new media forum comes, we're going to have that same old conversation. Um, and part of that conversation is a naive um, nostalgia for what uh, for a, a, an imagined golden age of the past. And this, there's this idea that back in the mid 20th century, uh, the media was this this space, um, radio and television in particular, where this space where folks were reasonable where people told the truth, where folks got along and there was lots of bipartisan compromise and it was just golden age of consensus. And, um, and, and the reason for that, so that's the first assumption. And then the reason for that is, uh, and here's the second assumption is because of the fairness doctrine. Um, and the fairness doctrine, the, the folks saying this have very little actual knowledge of the fairness doctrine. It just sounds good, I think, in part. It has the word fairness in it. Who's against fairness, right? It's like it's like asking a congressperson to vote against the like, uh, you know, sex trafficking bill. It's like, what are you for, sex traffickers? You know, you know. I, I, I've long contended that eventually every bill is going to be named the really, really good bill that everyone should vote for. <laughs> That's right. What you're against a really, really good bill. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's an element of that that there, uh, but there is just the so so there's this idea that that the fairness doctrine was responsible for a golden age of fairness and balance and reasonability in in broadcasting and the media more generally. The problem is is that when you actually just dip a toe into the actual history of the fairness doctrine, you realize that was very much the opposite. Now, in as much as there was some era of political consensus, and that's a whole thing that historians um, argue about, that's a, a kind of a separate conversation, the fairness doctrine had nothing to do with that. In fact, if anything, the fairness doctrine was a tool that was weaponized to suppress uh, uh, speech, it was a tool weaponized to advance the political interests of rent-seeking politicians and uh, uh, interest groups. It was very much the opposite. So the fairness doctrine was used to spread unfairness, uh, was used to stifle disagreement. Well, let's go back to the history on that, because it really comes from the fact that with broadcasting as a new technology, you know, the early days of radio in the 1920s, that it was brought under a legal framework that was basically outside of the First Amendment. You had one legal framework for newspapers and print publishing, which was under the First Amendment and full free speech rights. And you had a completely different one for broadcasting that was created where your right to broadcast, uh, your right to own a, a radio station, the broadcaster ideas, was dependent on whether you met some bureaucrats rather vague and arbitrary standard of what's in the public good. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean. Uh lawyers in our audience will be familiar with the evolution of kind of free speech protections for print uh, outlets, for newspapers during this, this time period. It's cases like near v. Minnesota, um, all the way up through like the Pentagon Papers cases in the, in the late 60s. So there's a series of court decisions that defend a high bar for against government intervention into free speech 
you know, government violations of the First Amendment um, for print. At the same time, the bar is being drastically lowered for broadcasting, for radio first and later for, for television as well, which meant that we have two completely different speech regimes um, in the United States in the 20th century, depending on the mass media form. So if it's print, again, very high bar, the government has to clear to, to control speech, to punish or reward favored or disfavored speech. In radio, it's just baked right in there. The government licenses radio stations. There's a whole series of decisions by the FCC, uh, which first, First, they prohibited station owners from editorializing, from using their stations to advance their own point of view. This was um, called the Mayflower? Uh, the Mayflower Doctrine. Yeah, the Mayflower that's Doctrine. That's it's, it's, it's FDR. President FDR doesn't like uh, newspaper owners who are buying radio stations and using them to criticize the New Deal. So it's an, the, the express purpose is to shut down criticism of the incumbent regime, of the, you know, of, of the incumbent uh, administration. Um, imagine... <laughs> imagine if someone tried to do that to newspapers, what an outcry there would be. If, if newspaper owners were not allowed to editorialize, they couldn't have an op-ed page um, because the, someone in the government, I don't know, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, didn't like what newspapers were saying about their administration. I mean, there'd be a huge outcry. And yet we routinized that um, for broadcasting. Well, and and so as you pointed out that the attack on broadcasting was also sort of aimed at newspaper owners it was newspaper owners who were yeah. going into broadcasting it was like now we've got you now we have a way to get revenge at you for that yeah. nasty op-ed you wrote uh nasty editorial you wrote about about me last week in your paper i'm going to prevent you from expanding your business into this new medium absolutely yeah it's an end run around the first amendment like so print's protected broadcasting isn't so what do you do if you want to go after print you go after their you know their broadcasting arm and, and nixon does this as well it's not just fdr it's not just jfk it's it's nixon i mean republicans and uh, democrats nixon you know he doesn't like what Catherine graham the owner of the washington post is allowing her journalists to do to investigate the watergate burglary the watergate scandal and cover up and uh, so but he can't go after the washington post directly because again high first amendment protections so what does he do? Well, he leans on his FCC chairman to push for a, for a variety of things. There's limits on how many stations um, in the same market that one one owner can can own. And she had too many television stations in Florida, in the, in South Florida. So she was forced essentially to sell. Now this is a rule that was honored in the breach, but you could target it at her, force her to sell a very profitable station. Um, she didn't back down though. Right. Uh, another way of going after her was the uh, it's actually Nixon's administration that starts the cross media ownership uh, ban. So there's a limit on how much if you own one form of media, a newspaper, you can only own so many, uh, uh, you know, radio or television stations. There's a you're not allowed to own too much of any kind. And that's a ban that, again, has its genesis in the Nixon's Nixon's FCC, an attempt to punish Catherine Graham, of the Washington Post. If he had gotten his way, if if there were if the speech regime that applied to print resembled that that applied to broadcasting, Nixon might very well have been able to suppress the Washington Post and gotten away with Watergate. Right, that's the power, um, but he didn't. We had, the the court smartly upheld a high barrier to First Amendment violation for print, and thank goodness, thank goodness that print regulation doesn't look like broadcast regulation. Right, and one of the aspects of this history is that you often had these very vague. Uh, rules that had lots of room for interpretation, or you had rules that were sort of, you put it honored in the breach, they were not widely enforced, but you could pick them out and you could decide, I'm going to enforce them against this guy in particular, because I don't like him. I and mean, we've seen that in um, congressional hearing in the last 10 or 20 years, congressional hearings where uh, they'll say, well, we, sh you know, we shouldn't be, we, the, the, we're going to grill uh, Rupert Murdoch, because we don't like what Fox News is doing. There was a, a senator, I think, who who criticized him because she didn't like the crawl that was put across the bottom of the screen of the screen on Fox, and you know she grilled him over that at a congressional hearing, and it's because the idea that we can prevent you from obtaining new broadcast, uh, you know, expanding your broadcast, we can keep you out of different markets because of these sort of latent powers that are really open to arbitrary use. Yeah, no, the rules are always very ambiguous. So like. With the Fairness Doctrine itself, which is kind of codified in 1959, though based on some 1949 uh, uh, precedent, um, it, it just it, really all it says is that 
uh, station owners have an obligation to air content about controversial issues of public importance. So they are supposed to talk about current events and politics, but in doing so, they're supposed to represent multiple points of view. They can't just give their own point of view, the view they're, you know, one view that they're sympathetic to. And um, actually in the 1949 precedent, um, they used the terms fair and balanced, not together, but long before Fox News talked about fair and being fair and balanced or or whatever, uh, that was the purpose of the fairness doctrine was create a fair, and the balanced uh, media landscape. But of course, if you, the rules weren't, it's a very hard thing to try to enforce. Um, I mean, you can imagine if you wanted to, if if the federal government from 1949 to 1963 had wanted to directly enforce some kind of media fairness on the airwaves, you would have to have created a federal bureaucracy filled with thousands or tens of thousands of people whose job was to listen to every radio station, to check instances, you know, to keep very close, careful track of how often they aired this point of view on the Vietnam War or on the, you know, a welfare bill or on whatever piece of, of legislation or current event or whatnot. And, you know, tally that up and then tally uh, the things on the other side. I mean, that's just not workable. And uh, there was, so if they probably have today with Facebook and social media where content moderation at scale is extremely difficult. Exactly. I mean, the problem has just gotten even bigger right now. So contrast, oh, you know, there were several thousand radio stations by the 1950s. Contrast that with, you know, billions of posts to Facebook every day around the globe. Mm -hmm. You know, literally billions, 350 million photos going up on Facebook every day. Um, So so it's, it's just even bigger of a problem, but it was true back then as well. So it's not really enforced, but it's just kind of lying there, this, this ambiguous and co-eight rule waiting for some savvy political operative to pick it up and selectively target it. And that's what JFK, uh, the JFK administration does. He tells his FCC chairman, uh, Bill Henry, uh, to, quote, keep the stations fair. Of course, Kennedy meant fair to me. Yeah. And so uh, the FCC... Uh, issues a, a clarification of the fairness doctrine where in July 1963 where it's it every example of the kind of unbalanced speech it's trying to correct are conservative forms of speech conservative points of view um, and every example of the kinds of speech it wants more of are liberal points of view um, and this isn't a commentary on the validity of those points of view in fact at that time that meant being conservative meant being for segregation being liberal meant being for civil rights so i mean it's clear who's right on that it's the, you know, the liberal side not the conservative side so it's not a commentary on the validity of the points of view just noting that it is a targeted it is a targeted effort and that's what the fcc does it only goes after stations airing right-wing points of view in an unbalanced fashion, not stations airing unbalanced left-wing points of view. So if you take a rule that's ostensibly mo- meant to be neutral, non-discriminatory, uh, uh, you know, uh, non, you know uh, not biased, and you just simply target it, it's the enforcement mechanism, you can do a lot of harm. Uh, and ultimately, it leads to the most successful episode of government censorship of the last half century. Now, the, the interesting thing about this is it's used by FDR, it's used by JFK, it's used by Nixon, you know, and people don't think when they, when they advocate for this, they don't think through this thing of like, you know, if we give this government this power that I really like to, to use against people that I don't like, it's going to be used potentially by somebody on the other side against people like me. I mean, you know, because Donald Trump just spent four years railing against fake news and about, you know, complaining. I, and there was actually a push. Uh, during his administration, I noticed conservatives started talking about how uh, we can, we can, the legal remedies we could use to prevent the, uh, this harm that was coming from the fake news on the mainstream media. So, yeah. you know, you give that power, it's going to be used, you know, the, the, the basic, I think you mentioned the, the test people have to put there is, you know, would I want to give this power to the people on the other side? Yeah, it's the, I call it the shoe on the other foot test, right? Like, uh, it might feel nice, comfy, and cozy while you're in power, but as long as we live in a functioning democracy, the other side's going to get a chance to be in power as well. And you might not like it when the shoe is on the other foot. Um, it, just as an illustration of this, um, one of the reasons in my book, I rely on a set of interviews that a former CBS news journalist named um, Fred Friendly conducted with several people involved in that FCC government censorship campaign. Um, you know, former 
JFK administration operatives, DNC, Democratic National Committee operatives, et cetera. And uh, he interviewed them. And one of the reasons they were willing to talk to him, and this was in the 70s, by like 73, 74, is that it dawned on them during the Nixon administration that, oh, if we get to use these powers to go after our political foes, it doesn't feel real nice when the other side does that to us. And they realized, because Nixon also found ways of using the fairness auction rate, as, as, as we've discussed. And so they were willing to talk to a journalist to kind of be like, okay, whoa, whoa let's, let's back away from the edge of the cliff here. And, and this is relevant now because you should, it, it is, the, there is one thing that both Donald Trump and Joe Biden agreed about during the political campaign in 2020. Both of them called for repealing Section 230, or significantly reforming it, of the Communication De uh, Decency Act, the, the key bill that provides um, uh, legal immunity for user published content on social media platforms, on, on online platforms, um, a key protection for uh, free speech, uh, uh, online free speech. And um, both of them, that's, that's the one thing they could agree on. They might not agree on the immigration. They might not agree on tax policy or, you know, and, and so on. But they did agree, got to get rid of Section 230. Um, this is the one thing that Richard Nixon and uh, you know, JFK agreed about in the 1960s was the utility of the fairness doctrine. Um, so, so that should make you, uh, you know, that should make your red, you know, your red flag warnings. There should be klaxon sirens, uh, sirens blaring when that's true. Now, both of them have different intents behind that rule, but in both cases, behind, you know, repealing that rule, but in both cases, um, they see that, you know, there was a utility to them or to, you know, political allies in removing that rule. And that really should um, send off the alarm bells. Well, let, let's talk about Section 230 for a minute, because that's really, I mean, the fairness doctrine applied to the broadcast media is, you know, people are, are touting it, people are bringing it up again. It, it, but it's it's not as relevant today because so much of the media is going on outside of broadcast. Yeah. Uh, so and Section 230 is what is one of the things that governs that, and it's it's described by its opponents sometimes as a handout or a special favor to media companies. But it was really I see it and I, I think you see it the same way as an attempt to bring the internet under the same legal framework that the print was under and instead of bringing it under you know if we had used the same principle for the internet as we used for broadcast you would have had you know the fcc would basically be regulating the internet if you have a website you have to be managing it in the public interest and you have a license and all yeah. that but they instead chose in the 1990s to say let's let's bring this under something based on and much more similar to what we have as a legal framework for print media yeah that's absolutely right yeah so what Section 230 does is it codifies something that had already been evolving out of jurisprudence in the decades prior, um, which is, and, and I'm, I'm, this is based on work by Jennifer Huddleston, uh, Brent Scorup. Um, they, they wrote an, a great paper on this subject, which is a 230-like understanding was already percolating up, percolating up from the court system. And the reason for that is because, you know, you're, you're presented with this case where, someone else writes something that gets hosted on a third party uh, outlet, who's responsible when that thing that is posted uh, offends sensibilities? You know, um, is it ultimately the person, is it the author or is it the third party host? And there was a whole body of jurisprudence, sorry, whole body of jurisprudence going back, um, you know, for a century that dealt with a similar question, which was the issue of bookstores. So think about this in the pre-digital era. If, if a book, you know, back in the 1920s, say, in the, in the, the first Red Scare, uh, the, the federal government is coming down hard on socialists and communists, shutting down uh, socialists and communist bookstores, et cetera. Um, well, and there was a bunch of cases that, or they're going to after, you know, what they called pornography or obscenity, which is a lot of now stuff assigned in classrooms because it's, you know, great art from the 1920s and 30s. Um, who is responsible for that obscene or offensive or dangerous content? Is it the bookstore that happens to sell the book or is it the author themselves? Um, and over time, they started to recognize, oh, if we hold the bookstores liable, um, that will lead bookstores just to drop all even vaguely controversial content. That will have a huge chilling effect on speech, even forms of speech we like. Sure, it might shut down the commies, and of course, the court system in the 1940s and 50s was 
A-OK with shutting down the commies, whether they should, I mean, I'm a civil libertarian, so I'm opposed to that, but they were A-OK with that, but they realized, oh, they'll also shut down kind of a vast range of left-wing radical speech and a vast range of right-wing radical conservative speech. Uh, we That's bad for discourse. That's a violation of the First Amendment. So the court systems started protecting bookstores. They gave them immunity from, you know, they're not liable for the books they put on their shelves. Um, and, uh, that principle is applied to the internet and then it, in section 230. It is just applying a print regime, this kind of precedent from bookstores to the internet. That like, So think of your, you know, think of Facebook or Twitter or whatever as a bookstore. Um, that's that's what the, the courts did. That's what Congress did in 1996. And we should be thankful. Yeah. That's interesting to me because, you know, you said we have the same arguments over and over again. And people tend to think, oh, well, this is a totally new technology. It's completely different. And you discovered that the, the legal basis yeah. for the internet was based on, 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 on neighborhood bookstores. Yeah, is it, it, that's the thing is that like, just because it's ones and zeros transmitted across a wire doesn't fundamentally change what we're talking about, which is words. It's just words at the end of the day, right? Words on page, words on screen. At the end of the day, it's words. Um, so we get all tied up in the technological difference and, and miss that it's essentially the same concept of what we're, what we're, what we're doing. And so, yeah, we should be absolutely thankful that uh, just as a, a happenstance of history, an accident of history, that Congress and the courts in the 80s and 90s decided to go with um, – one metaphor over the other, that the online world, the digital space would be um, like print rather than like broadcasting. Because you can make an argument for either, right? Now, you can tell they went with print because we did things like email, it's a physical thing, uh, online forums and uh, uh, um, uh, boards, you know, message boards. Yeah, Bolton Bolton board. boards, right? That like, these are all meat space, tangible metaphors that we're using for this new digital space. But if you look at the underlying technology, uh, the internet is a form of broadcasting. It's all about electromagnetic. It's all about radiation, electromagnetic. Uh, it, you know, it's just electricity running along wires, right? Like it, yeah. you could make just as much of an argument that the internet is just a form of cable. I mean, in fact, it's carried by cable companies. That's how most people, you know, still today get their internet. So it is a form of broadcasting, um, but the courts in Congress decide that they like this mail print metaphor more than they like the broadcasting metaphor. And so as this, as a kind of a happy accident of history, they regulate it like print and not like in a hands-off way and not like broadcasting in a hands-on way. So thank goodness. I think there's also a wider cultural context though, because you know in the 1920s, it was sort of the, the height of the progressive movement where the idea of free speech, I mean, you know, Woodrow Wilson spent World War I locking up uh, people who, who uh, were against the draft. I mean, he, he was not, the, 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 we think of the progressives today, you know, the left, they were in their origins, they were not pro-free speech people. They were very much in favor of the idea that you know, social control comes over individual rights. And I think in the 1990s, by the time we got the internet, and especially the early internet was a wild and crazy place where people liked that, that freedom and that lack of control. And the idea of individual rights coming before, you know, the freedom, freedom of discussion and individual rights coming before the needs of social control and, you know, can you show that this is the public interest, that was sort of more ascendant ideologically at the time. And that's part of the reason we got that. And that's my concern about, you know, the calls right now for more control over the internet and over, over, um, over media is that we're swinging back to, and I think both on the left and the right, swinging back to this idea that no, the needs of society as interpreted by my, uh, by my faction take precedent over the need for the individual to be free to express his ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, it's, you know, the eighties was this period of kind of the opposite bipartisan consensus. You had, you know, new Democrats, you, as much as we like to make fun of Al Gore, Al Gore was always a pro tech, uh, pro innovation Democrat. And he just wanted to spend government money to help support it. But at the end of the day, he was not a, a Luddite. 
right? He's not a Elizabeth Warren or a whoever, Bernie Sanders, who are opposed to technology kind of on the face of it because it's socially disruptive. No, he wanted, uh, so like your Al Gore, your Michael Dukakis, well, there's a wave of- might be a little on the, the other side of things. Uh, if you, remember, you might not be old enough to remember her campaign against uh, music, uh, against- Oh yeah, music. well, Tipper, yeah, Tipper's another question. Yeah, but <laughs> Al himself was, you know, yeah, yeah. So it, that's a funny- uh, it is funny to remember a time where, um, uh, again, the concerns about harmful speech on the internet, nothing new under the sun. You, you know, the, 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 the moral panic around, oh no, there's, there's rock bands and uh, you know, those rock and rollers are degrading the morals of our youths, you know, Twisted Sister and D Snyder and Black Sabbath, and we got to shut them down. We got to do something about this, you know, scourge that's affecting. So all those fears are still present today. It's just now it's, you know, oh, YouTube's algorithm is going to corrupt the hearts and minds of our teenagers as they go down the radicalization rabbit hole. Same kind of thing, same discourse as in the 90s and Tipper Gore and the congressional investigation into obscenity and music. Yeah, it's interesting to see that back then, you know, you still had Democrats, uh, people on the Democratic side who were very conservative culturally. Yeah. And now, of course, you have the same kind of moral panic, but it's flipped to being yeah. sort of, you know, culturally radical or, you know, race being the issue uh, and racism being used as the bogeyman that we're, we're, we're going to, uh, to go after. But let's talk about this issue because now it's also used on the right now. There's a lot of complaints. They say, well, no, the problem now isn't government censorship. It's that by letting publishers and platforms make these decisions, that they've imposed their own regime of censorship and it's impossible, you know, we're, we're being silenced. It's impossible to be heard because they're imposing their own private censorship under this section 230 kind of regime yeah so th there's a whole there's a whole list of reasons why this is uh based in a misunderstanding of of the you know the, both the media and the uh, internet landscape um so i, I think the, the place i'd start is just by noting that the publisher platform uh distinction is uh is a myth it's a thing invented by bad faith actors uh, relatively recently. Um, John Kossoff is a great, he's a legal scholar, has a great book about the 26 words about Section 230, where he dispels this idea, um, uh, this notion that when uh, platforms start acting like publishers, no longer Section 230 liability should apply. That's a thing that we invented several years ago, not uh, a thing that's actually there codified in the law. Um, what strikes me about that publisher platform thing too is that it really goes back to that that broadcast model of saying that if you know why would it be if you're a publisher you have less freedom, right? And that really it's almost like the, it's like a Mayflower doctrine, right? That yeah. they used back in in the early days of radio, saying if you're the owner of a radio station you cannot editorialize with your own views. So it's like the idea if you're a publisher you have less freedom to speak than if you're just a platform. Well, and you're absolutely right. And the, and the logic is actually quite similar with the Mayflower Doctrine. The justification was, well, there's only so many radio stations in an area. And so they have a kind of quasi monopoly on the dissemination of news inf information. Therefore, uh, they shouldn't be allowed to give their own points of view because they'll kind of dominate the, the, you know, the spread of information. And you can hear the same thing today. The reason why Facebook or Twitter or whoever shouldn't act like publishers is because they have a quasi monopoly and which in neither case is that actually true. Um, it was not true in the 19, in 19, in the 1940s, the Mayfowler doctrine, there were actually lots of radio stations in as much as there was scarcity, it was imposed, artificially imposed scarcity created by the FCC, which, uh, which restricted the number of radio stations in the 1930s in dr drastic ways. And today, um, the idea that, that these companies are monopolies is utterly bizarre. They're neither monopolies in terms of their finances because they all actually compete. They might not all provide the same free or subsidized uh, user service. You know, Google provides lots of search. Uh, Facebook provides, you know, social media, but they all compete with each other for ad revenue. They're, at the end of the day, these are all, uh, their financial model is selling ads. Um, that's, so they're all in direct financial competition. So they're not monopolies in that sense. But even in, in terms of uh, what the services they provide, None of these are like locked down airtight monopolies. You know, people of a certain age remember when everyone worried about MySpace being a monopoly. Um, that seems quaint 
I, I dug up some stuff. I dug up some stuff from the late 1990s where uh, AOL Instant Messaging was the big monopoly service that was going to dominate <laughs> dominate the world. That we had to be worried about. That's great. Yeah, yeah. No AOL. Uh, that, that's also back there in the area of the uh, Microsoft antitrust uh, case. Yeah. Um, all those things within a few years feel archaic and outdated. And the same thing's true now, like take Facebook. So Facebook, you know, there it's, it is the least popular big tech social media company. Like, you know, it, it and Twitter are right at the bottom of the list of what users say they hate the most. Um, lots of people still use them, but yeah, they're being punished. Back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, but they're being punished severely by in the market right now. So Facebook has declining Top line declining users in the United States, its most profitable market, it's actually losing users outright. What users it retains use it less often. And most of it, its loss in both user attention and absolute number of users is most is starkest in the most desirable demographic sec- section, you know, the 18, like 39 year olds. Um, they're in real trouble. Like they're in kind of and they know that they're in, in basically younger users in particular are flooding things like TikTok, Instagram, you know, all kinds of other platforms. Um, Cause like social media also think of it this way. Yes. Facebook looks different than say TikTok, but they both scratch the same itch, right? Like they both provide social interaction for users, the ability to, you know, interact, to post stuff, to comment, to like, to subscribe, all that kind of stuff. It, it, so even though they don't look identical, they are direct competitors. And so if you're Facebook knows that, right, they try to buy some upstart, you know, so, some upstart companies that some challengers uh, to their to their incumbency. But with TikTok, they tried to clone it off in something called Lasso a few years back, which was an utter dismal failure. They had they shut it down within a, a matter of, I think, a little over a year. Um, they're losing to TikTok. They're being punished by their users. So like it's the market is functioning. This is not some insuperable monopoly that uh, you know that is inescapable. People are leaving it in droves. So you know I, I think that's the first place. I first thing I'd point out is that this idea that these are monopoly like platforms that are thus like the government um, that should be you know treated like the government. They shouldn't be allowed to. They shouldn't be considered private businesses that can regulate their own content however they wish it's predicated on several false assumptions that the idea that they're a monopoly and that they are government like in their kind of permanent control of their market segment. Neither of those things are true. Yeah. And, and the, the bigger question I have is, you know, if you say, well, government should get involved and there should be some law and that should be limited into what they could do. Well, what does that look like? How does that actually get implemented? And mm-hmm. I think you're, you're up against the same problem. It was talked before about how there's so many thousands of hours of radio being yeah. broadcast every day. There's no way for the federal government to monitor it all. So they end up enforcing it piecemeal and somewhat arbitrarily and in a biased way. It's very easy to do it in a very bi- in a biased way. And I think you get the same thing. I mean, you know, that, that as it's expanded, you know, orders of ba- many orders of magnitude, that problem of uh, content moderation at scale, nobody can monitor a billion Facebook posts, uh, billions of Facebook posts a day. Nobody can monitor. I mean, I, I, I go, crazy trying to keep up with anything on Twitter. Yeah. It, it's it's all, and then I, TikTok might as well be Mars as far as I'm concerned. It's like the kids can have that. I, yeah. I'm overloaded. <laughs> as I am. Uh, you know, there's so much out there. There's no way to monitor it. So my concern is the way that any any rule you come up with, the way it's going to be enforced, is it's going to be enforced by who ticks off somebody who's powerful, uh, who has the, who controls the levers of government. And if you tick off somebody who who's, uh, you know, who, uh, the administration or a powerful congressman or something like that, then the scrutiny comes on to you. And it kind of ends up being just another tool for suppression of unpopular ideas or suppression of criticism of the powerful. I think it's absolutely right. And, and the difference, right? So it was infeasible to create a government apparatus that would monitor broadcasting in the mid 20th century. Not impossible, infeasible. That you know, both the, the expense, but also the political capital and will wasn't there. It is impossible today to do that right it's not just infeasible it's literally impossible to 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 human for human beings to monitor everything that's being posted in social media so what you do instead is you do it algorithmically but if you and and you know 
that's fine. They do it all the time, right? There's a reason why your Facebook feed is not choked with pornography. Right. They, it, algorithmically, you know, the algorithm, I, they have a, you know, a machine learning based image recognition software package that looks for pornography and flags it um, and automatically pulls it down. You can contest it, et cetera. But that's all done not by human beings, but by an algorithm, by a, a program. And, um, but the problem is if you, the more you extend that, the more things you extend that to, the more stuff you get that gets swept up in the net, right? More false positives. And, and there's stories like this, just, I, I, you know, Tech Dirt, uh, Mike Masnick's website covers this stuff all the time. But it's like, you know, the person who's trying to uh, commemorate the Holocaust, but the algorithm can't tell the difference between someone commemorating the loss of life in the Holocaust and the Holocaust denier, or someone criticizing fascism with someone promoting fascism, right, with, through Nazi imagery and the like. It, my, it, favorite, it's, my favorite example was uh, people on uh, people on chess Twitter, uh, or is it yeah. Facebook, or they, they were talking about black and white, and black attacking white, and white attacking black, <laughs> and, and they were, you know, it was like- Race were, war. <laughs> yeah, race war. <laughs> yeah, well, well, there was another one I just saw today, uh, from the, the information where they, they recount this story about Spotify uh, two year, three years back, holding a, like an all employee panel talking about content moderation. And to make a point, they said, hey, would you guys, you know, if you had the vote, would you leave up or pull down a song that encourages violence against the police in very like raw graphic terms? And they all said, oh yeah, yeah. They, they read the lyrics to them. They said, oh, yeah, absolutely. That doesn't belong in here. That promotes, well, it was an NWA song, the famous, the police, um, which is, you know, um, might be an acquired taste, but it's rec broadly recognized as a piece of, you know, artwork and it, it, you, you, not something worth censoring. And, um, and everyone's kind of sheepish, but it's a reminder of just how hard content moderation is at scale. And as you try to moderate more and more stuff, you flag, you flag things, you create false positives, and you ultimately create a chilling effect on speech. So if you want less radical speech in general, and by radical, I mean, yes, uh, the groups you don't like, if you're on the right, that means you don't like socialists or communists, I suppose. And if you're on the left, you don't like you know, conservatives of various varieties. If you want less of all of that kind of speech, indeed, probably less just political speech in general than scaling up content moderation to go after political points of view is a great way to produce a much more anodyne, depoliticized uh, internet. And that's what we could get. That's what yeah. we could get. Well, and, and uh, again, it goes to this idea of is vibrant individual freedom and expression more important than the top-down social control? Yeah. And, and the whole the whole thing about moderation strikes me as, you know, as as people who are more on the libertarian end of the spectrum, I think we're more primed with this idea of the illusion of central planning as something that's going to be able to manage all these vast number of individual decisions being made by free individuals out in the world. And the issue of using government to somehow deal with content moderation strikes me as a great example of that. Because you know, the fundamental problem here is that content moderation is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult yeah. to do on a small scale. It's impossible to do on a large scale. You end up having, at the same time, it's kind of necessary because nobody's going to want to use Facebook if it's, I mean, at the very basic level, it would get uh, clogged up with spam, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would it, it would look like eight uh, chan or eight con or you know four chan back in the day. Like most people don't want their Facebook feed to look like a cesspool. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, I, well, I, 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 when I was uh, my first encounter with the internet was in the late eighties. It was Usenet news groups were totally un, unmoderated, and there's there's nothing you can see out there. And I need these other places that I haven't already seen. You know, back then years ago, uh, because that's the nature of a totally unmoderated form. It gets crammed with junk. Um, and, but I was even on a more basic level as, you know, as someone who's run a website, the first, one of the first things you have to do is you have to protect the comments field and the, you have to limit the comments field and even your contact form on your website. Those will get filled with just spam people sending you, you know, yeah. ads for bogus nutritional supplements, because apparently people are suckers about <laughs> nutritional supplements, especially. Um, and so to have a function explained at all, you have to do some form of blocking and content moderation, it's extremely hard to do well. Most sites do it badly, but then there's this illusion that, oh, well, we'll pass a law and we'll put a government agency in there and that will somehow do this better than the company yeah. can do. It's just, it's, it magically just will, right? Like uh, it, it's, a, it's a 
faith it's it's a faith based proposition not you know the, the government will this government agency will magically be more efficient more effective uh more less uh less uh more neutral less arbitrary than the the you know private actors would be is is an object is a faith based proposition um and and i think your other apprehension is correct i mean the best case scenario is simply a chilling effect uh, the worst case scenario is the manipulation of these rules for partisan political advantage. Right. That certainly happened with fairness doctrine and the broadcasting regime. Both sides in, indulged in, you know, in partisan rent-seeking behavior. Um, but it would be true of the internet as well. I, I'm thinking here, uh, Josh Hawley proposed a bill a few summers ago that would have empowered the FTC to create a panel, I think, of five members. And if... Um, large platforms, large online platforms of a certain size, they would have to come to that panel every year to be certified that they were being non-discriminatory, non -discriminatory. they were being politically neutral. And if only two of the five uh, commissioners, and it, so that means even just the two minority party members of the commission, uh, said that they weren't being adequately non-discriminatory, they would lose their Section 230 liability and, and, and some other punishments, um, which you can imagine how easy that would be to game for political purposes. I mean, do you think that two Trump appointees, let's just use the example when the bill was proposed, do you trust two Trump appointees uh, out of the five commissioners to just dispassionately uh, with zero input from Mr. Twitterati in chief uh, to, to approve the neutrality of literally any website, WashingtonPost.com, uh, you name it. Well, that would be immediately a site of intense beat backdoor uh, political skullduggery and organizing and, and focus. Like it would deeply politicize that process. It would not be neutral, not be efficient. It would, it would be highly arbitrary and manipulated for gross um, uh, partisan advantage. Uh, I can't think of a regime, and uh, you know, Hawley's is a particularly bad one because it's only two out of five rather than three. But even with three, again, the party in power would then be able to, there'd be lots of informal pressure um, just like what JFK did, just like what Richard Nixon did, just like what Donald Trump wanted to do but couldn't do because he didn't have the power. I mean, Donald Trump routinely tweeted his desire to revoke the licenses for various news organizations he didn't like, whether or not he actually could or not. Like he actually tweeted, uh, NBC News criticized his nuclear weapons policy at one point, and he said the FCC should look into their license. Well, NBC News doesn't have a license. Uh, stations have licenses, not the network. So it was kind of dumb on the face of it, but it is an expression of his desire. Once upon a time, presidents did have the power to lean on the FCC to approve or not approve licenses. Once upon a time, he could have gotten that done if he was a savvier president like JFK or Richard Nixon. Um, and that should scare us, right? That should not, <laughs> that, that's a cautionary tale. Right. And you talk about, you talk about the fact if Trump would do it, I, absolutely based on his behavior, he would do this if he could. But also, you know, but I don't know about Biden, you know, maybe he would do it. Kamala Harris, I'm pretty sure she would. Um, and or or Elizabeth Warren. I mean, she's, you know, what uh, she had a recent thing where she, you know, criticized somebody for basically criticizing a senator. Yeah, uh, well, very... I'll, I'll give you an illustration from the other side of the aisle. So it's not the president in this case, but, you know, Congress people also have input. They can lean on the FCC, uh, you know, um, they do throughout my book as well back in the 1960s. But uh, several Congress, uh, Congress people just sent a letter to the FCC. They don't want them to approve a, uh, there's a radio station, I think in Miami, that uh, currently appeals to, you know, the Cuban American community, yeah. the large, you know, um, Hispanic community down in Southern Florida. And it's going to change ownership, I think, to a conservative ownership group. And um, they don't want the approval to go through because they don't want more, you know, conservative voices reaching a Cuban American audience in South Florida. And so, con you know, Democratic Congress people are trying to lean on the FCC to not approve the transfer. Like that, I mean, that's deeply, I mean, it's a deep corruption of the process and it's normal, it's routine. Do you want that kind of uh, system being applied to the internet where members of Congress, where people in the, you know, in the presidential administration can lean on the government agency uh, to change the rules or to apply the rules in ways that punish their opponents and reward their allies? I, that's horrifying to me, to be frank. 
Yeah, so I want to close on the observation, though, that on the one hand, the fact that you have people on the left and people on the right doing this is kind of terrifying because you have this like co coalition of people on both sides fighting over everything else, but all in agreement that the government should have more power over what we say on the internet. On the other hand, the good thing about it is this sort of Madisonian thing that you know the two factions don't unite because they hate each other so much. And as you put it, the other uh, uh, foot of the other uh, shoe on the other foot test, which is that each one will be somewhat limited by the prospect that wait, if I put this into power, this into into effect, the other side will get to do this to me. Yeah, well, the, the, hopefully, I mean, right, like that's, that is the best case scenario is that they, they act as a kind of check on each other, their kind of raw avarice and ambition, and fear of the other will act as a check. Um, but I, I, I it is possible, it, it's hard to exaggerate the kind of sheer unearned confidence of the Politico, right, like, and how rude they are, it's, it's, they exist in the eternal present the eternal now. Um, there is no past, like trying to get politicians interested in history for its own sake is an impossible task. Um, but it's, it's you know, what made us win last election and how are we going to win the next election? That's it. That's the, that is the limits of their, imagine, of their imagination. And so <clears throat> there is this just kind of sense where, hey, uh, whoever has, you know, it, at, at the moment, congressional Democrats have a thin majority um, but with the filibuster, it makes it hard for them to do anything. But if they could accomplish something, I think they would immediately they would immediately forget all the lessons from the Trump era and pass the kinds of rules that Trump would have used in ways that they would have found deeply unpleasant out of a naive certainty that all that matters is the next two or the next four years. And hey, we're in charge right now. What could go wrong? And, and so historians and people who are you know reading about the past are saying, here's what can go wrong. Lots of things can go wrong. Don't do this. And, uh, you know, Cassandra, like we get uh, ignored. <laughs> well, I'll, I'm not ignoring you and I hope uh, my, my viewers aren't going to ignore you. Uh, so I really want to thank you for coming on and, and filling in that those warnings uh, from history. I think you're right there. The, you know, the technology changes, but the basic issues are just rehashed over and over again. And we need to keep that in the forefront of our mind and keep learning those lessons from the past. So thanks so much for spelling that out for us. Thanks. It was my pleasure. I'm Rob Trusinski with Symposium Magazine. My guest today has been Paul Matsko, editor for Technology and Innovation Policy at the Cato Institute and author of The Radio Right. You can subscribe to this uh, podcast on YouTube or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcasting service. You can also find more ideas and discussion and debate at symposium.substack.com. Thank you for joining the conversation.